Biomass has been used by humans for millennia. In recent decades, biomass became of interest as a renewable energy to, in effect, replace fossil fuels that, that actually replaced them several centuries before. The key bit really in terms of, uh, for this particular set of demonstrators is the fact we've got fast growing plants like Miscanthus, like short rotation coppice willow. The plants are constantly in this fast mode of growth. You have a lot of photosynthesis, a lot of carbon gets drawn down, that gets harvested, we generate energy from that importantly, we combine that with carbon capture and storage and so we get this negative emission technology, so greenhouse gas removal, which is what the set of demonstrators are all about. So we're working on Miscanthus breeding here, they're working on willow breeding in Rothamsted. So we're both generating new crop varieties, which is really important, because if you're setting off on a, on a new sector, you need, for, you need multiple varieties. You don't want to base an industry on a, a narrow range of genetic material because of the risks, potential risks of, uh, of pests and diseases. Yeah, Miscanthus has a, a large rhizome system to help it grow. Um, so it can grow on very poor soils as well, still producing reasonable yields. So you get a large biomass within a short amount of time. So above ground yield, it is very important for the biomass crop um, because you want to get the, the most out of the field um, in terms of price for the farmer and also um, if it's for, for, to be used as a, as a biomass product you know into making concrete or plasterboard um, or to go into a, a energy station the, the more biomass you can produce in the smallest area possible the better. Flowering green. And then also, because it's a perennial crop with a large rooting system, it stays in the ground for a long time, um, doesn't need a lot of inputs from fertilisers. Um, and because it does, it's not an annual, it doesn't need ploughing every year, then that's beneficial for soil carbon. And that grass gets planted, it'll be in the ground typically, let's say, for 20 years, but it's harvested annually. So farmers are getting annual, annual harvest and income, um, but from a perennial system. And because the, we're harvesting the plant um, after the winter, so the nitrogen has been remobilized in the plant, we're basically harvesting carbon. So we're not fertilizing that crop on an annual basis. So it's very low input to output. So we end up with an energy input to output ratio about 30, 30 to 40 to one. The other crop we're looking at is short rotation coppice willow. So this is um, a, a, a willow tree that's basically harvested it typically every three years. So it's cut down to the ground and new shoots emerge. And again, that crop would typically be in the ground 20 to 30 years. And in effect, by having those two crops, we've got one grassy, one woody crop. They tend to be suited in different, different part areas of the country, but also by different farm, farmers and their farmers' systems. So some people are more used to growing arable crops or grassland. They're probably more likely maybe to grow miscanthus. Others that maybe have areas of woodland and you know, work on forestry or maybe more inclined to grow willow. So in a sense, we've got two options there. The beauty of, of these crops is that actually they tend to grow on more degraded land. They're quite happy in wet, wetter conditions. I think there's a, an idea that they will be used more on kind of the marginal land because it's not very productive for any other usage or it's kind of a bit of rough grazing. Maybe they're the prime areas for this because they're not impacting on other land uses that we then have to look for alternative sources for. And, and also it, it's that, is it a win-win? Is this another income stream for uh, farmers and landowners? Within the project, we're testing a number of sort of agronomy methods to improve planting and growth of mis miscanthus, particularly in the establishment years, so that it can be easily 
um, brought up to scale for uh, more commercial usage. Part of that is reducing costs, but a big part is also how do we do that in a way where we get the maximum greenhouse gas removal potential and actually, for example, do the least amount of ploughing, apply the least amount of chemicals during the, the land use transition. Some of the miscanthus traits we're looking at, particularly below ground, um, we're looking at differences in root architecture and rhizome formation, um, the cell wall composition of the roots and rhizome, um, some of the, the root exudates, so the way that um, the roots and the soil system interacts. That different varieties or genotypes actually accumulate different amounts of soil carbon. So basically we could in effect breed for, for soil carbon accumulation, which I think is quite, well, I think is very exciting. So we're going in much deeper on this project, we're expanding that out, and that should allow us then to start thinking about breeding for soil carbon accumulation as a specific um, target, which could be actually much bigger than for Miscanthus. So this could be a significant way by which agriculture and farming could really contribute to greenhouse gas removal. We're also, importantly, I think for the first time in the projects we've been working on, have actually got social scientists as part of the Countryside and Communities Research Institute at University of Gloucester, who are very much looking at the attitudes of farmers and in rural communities to the adoption of these crops. So it's very much around how do we do the technology, upscaling, but also how do we understand the wider environmental and social impacts of doing that. On the other side of the balance, they show the impacts on possible people So really, that, this project, I would say for the first time, certainly I think in these projects we've had in the UK have actually brought all those elements together. So some of this has been done, in effect, really at, uh, at commercial scale now, at demonstration. So we've got 10 hectare um, sites where we have an energy crop um, with a comparison either arable crop or grassland crop as well. In addition, we're part of a, a broader um, network, um, which is called Biomass Connect, um, and that is putting a larger number of, of different varieties into a large number of sites. So there's eight hub sites across the whole of the UK, so all, um, all four nations in the, in the UK, we, that, so that basically farmers can go and actually see those crops growing in the field. So a range of grass species and a range of uh, also tree species, um, including the coppice in that. Classically, the, 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 the kind of barriers we come up against is, is the fact that uh, it's, it's potentially the cost of establishment. So in effect, it's, it's, it's thinking of the upfront costs. It's also, you know, have I got a market? Is there going to be somebody who's going to take that? So there's an element of chicken and egg. The other bit is who's going to, who, who can give me some advice here in terms of I'm going to be doing something different. My neighbouring farmers, you know, probably aren't doing this. Where do I go to get that uh, advice? And so projects like this are very much seeking to, uh, to to basically plug that gap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Water fire charging yeah. when it's not supposed to be. So you've got, a, you've got a suite of technologies you can use, like biochar, like peatland restoration, um, and also like the use of uh, crushed basalt for accelerated weathering, that you can actually stack together. So you can have biomass with biochar, we're doing that as part of this project, particularly looking at how we can add biochar, not only to increase the greenhouse removals, but also reduce emissions when we're doing land use transitions. We're also working with the peatland project about how you can use biomass crops during peatland restoration. So um, you can also help in, in terms of maximise the greenhouse gas removal potential there as well. We know we have these very significant climate change targets, particularly around getting to be net zero by 2050. And we need these greenhouse gas removal technologies as part of it. This is very much about saying, right, well, we know we've got this technology. How do we scale it up? And how can we scale it up in a way where we get maximum greenhouse gas removal potential?